there is still movement on the side, on this corridor. Either we ask the people to come inside or they remain outside. There's no problem. رحم الله من قرأ سورة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الرحمن الرحيم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما وليكم الله ورسوله والذين آمنوا الذين يقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة وهم راكعون The first of our loud salawat in honor of رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second in honor of أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa'l-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The discussion concerning the proclamation, Ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah, is arguably one of the most fascinating discussions in Islamic thought. At the same time, it is viewed as being one of the most controversial statements in Islamic history, and a statement which requires a thorough analysis, for it is a statement which affects the lives of millions around the world today. Many people would have heard when they come towards the call of prayer, this particular statement. As in if you go to Iraq today, or you go to Iran, or even parts of Lebanon and Syria, you will hear within what is known as the Adhan in the Arabic language, this particular line, Ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah. You find, however, that there are other schools within the religion of Islam who do not understand, firstly, the philosophy of Ali and waliyullah, and secondly, when did this actually come into the Adhan? And the idea that many times, many of us would have been asked the question, that we can understand Ashhadu anna Muhammadan, Rasulullah being in the Adhan. But Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah is not something that was there from the time of Rasulullah. <coughs> and indeed this led many to ask the question on this issue. Many came forward later and they began to ask the question, that when you come into your Adhan in your mosques, how is it that you could add to the Adhan something which Rasulullah never recited? Because in their idea, the Adhan is a call, no one can come and add, and no one can come and remove. Therefore they say, <coughs> that the Adhan that has to be kept is the Adhan of the Holy Prophet. The Adhan of the Holy Prophet would have had Allahu Akbar, would have had a shara'an la ilaha illallah, would have had a shara'an Muhammad Rasulullah, but not this statement. Likewise, when you ask many of the followers of Ahlul Bayt about the line, Ashhadu anna Ali and waliullah, you'll find that many of the followers do not know the origin of this statement. At the same time, many do not know the philosophy of the statement. When we say Ali, Waliullah, what do we mean? What is the basis and the background of this line? Therefore, what do you find? You find that this needs a thorough dissection. There is a crest on the back for people to move closer to the front. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. 
<coughs> brothers, please move closer to the front. For those brothers who are coming in, there is no space. <coughs> Therefore, when you come to this analysis, the analysis asks the question, what is the origin and the philosophy of Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah? And how do we explain this statement to our brethren from other schools in Islam? Because as we said, the aim of these 15 nights is for the school of Ahlul Bayt to explain itself to other schools and for the other schools to also read their heritage about our beliefs and our opinions as well. Therefore, let's dissect this issue in a number of stages. Number one, what is the origin and philosophy of Adhan in Islam? <clears throat> and where did it originate from? Number two, can we add or subtract from the Adhan? And if we can, where did the additions take place before Ali and Waliullah? Number three, what is the meaning of Ali and Waliullah? And how is this statement understood within Shia thought? Number four, is Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah obligatory or not? If it is not obligatory part of the Adhan, then why do we state it? And number five, which famous companion of Rasulullah said that he would never curse Ali ibn Abi Talib, yet his son ended up killing the sons of Ali. Let's dissect this and dissect this topic in depth. When we come to the Adhan, we find the Adhan is known as the call of prayer in the religion of Islam. Wherever you go in the world today, you find that the Adhan is called far and wide. From an area like India to Indonesia, from Spain to, for example, Brazil, you will find that there are Muslims everywhere who come towards this call of Adhan. When these Muslims come towards this beautiful call of Adhan, the question arises, when did this Adhan originate? As in, who originated this Adhan? You find that from the time of Rasulullah, you find that some people came forward and said that if the Salah was originated in Medina, then the Adhan would be originated in Medina as well. And they are right. The Adhan was originated in Medina. Why? Because as we know, in Mecca, Rasulullah was trying to instill Usul al-Din. In Medina, Rasulullah was trying to instill the Furu'ah. In Mecca, the Usul, what are they? He was trying to instill the belief in the oneness of God, the prophethood of the Holy Prophet, for example, the belief in the day of judgment. When it came to Medina, what was he trying to instill in Medina? When he came to Medina, he was trying to instill an understanding of the practices of these beliefs. Amongst the practices were the verses on Salah. So for example, sometimes you had a verse on Salah which began, أَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةِ but when the salah was originated, the companions began to ask a question. Now that it is obligatory on everyone to pray, how do we call everyone towards prayer? And this is where us and our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah differ on the issue. Our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah say that the Adhan was originated by a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abid Rabbah. <laughs> Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abid Rabbah, they say, is the man who originated the Adhan. You see what happened was, they say Rasulullah was saying, how do we call people towards the Adhan? So some people came forward and said, Ya Rasulullah, we'll call people towards the Adhan by hitting a bell. So when the bell goes, <coughs> everyone knows it's the time of Dhuhr or the time of Asr, or the time of Maghrib, or the time of Isha or Fajr. Rasulullah said no, according to that narration. Someone else said, Ya Rasulullah, we'll blow a trumpet. And when we blow the trumpet, everyone will know it's the time of Adhan. Again, Rasulullah said no. Someone else said, Ya Rasulullah, we'll just get some pieces of wood and beat the people until they come to Salah. <coughs> I'm sure you understand, Rasulullah said no. So you found that everyone was coming with a different suggestion as to how you should call people towards Adhan. Rasulullah seemingly is bemused. He's not sure how to call people and he's confused as well. At this moment, a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abid Rabbah comes towards the Holy Prophet 
And he says to him, Ya Rasul Allah, in my dream last night, I saw what the adhan should be. Rasul Allah said to him, Yes, what is it? What should the adhan be? He replied by saying, First we say Allahu Akbar four times. Then we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Then we say, Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasul Allah. Then we say, Hayya ala salah. Hayya ala al falah. Hayya ala khair al amal. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Rasul Allah said, O oh people, what Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abid Rabbah says is true. This is going to be our adhan from now. Umar ibn al-Khattab was not far away. Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he heard this, he said, I saw the same dream. And I have been told of the same adhan. <coughs> and I wanted to tell you about this as well. In other words, what do we find? We find that according to our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah, the person who originated the adhan was who? Was Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abid Rabbah. And if you want further details on this, you can find Malik in his Muwatta. If you, leave, if you read the Sharh of the Muwatta by Zarqani, there's a major analysis on this area. An analysis on how Abdullah bin Zayd came forward and originated the Adhan. We in the school of Ahlul Bayt differ with this. How? We reply firstly by looking at it academically. If you want to look at Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abd Rabbah, first let's look at the issue academically. Is this hadith that Zay Abdullah bin Zayd is the one who originated the Adhan? Is it in Bukhari? No, it's not in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. Is it in Muslim? <coughs> no, it's not in the Sahih of Muslim. Where would you find it? You'd find it outside of these main works. That's on the first level. On the second level, Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abid Rabbah, years later, a narration talks about his daughter asking Umar bin Abdul Aziz for help. Because she was in a predicament. Yet his daughter, when she mentions Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abid Rabbah, some narrations say his sister, she doesn't mention that he's the man who originated the Adhan. You would think she would mention that my brother is the man who originated the Adhan. Therefore, help me out. She doesn't mention this at all. Therefore, you find that those who say Abdullah bin Zayd bin Abid Rabbah is the man who originated the Adhan, Academically, on the first level, we say it's not in the main text, nor does his family members ever mention him. On the second level, why would Rasul Allah look for someone else to bring the adhan and not he himself brings it from the Lord of the heavens? If the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَالنَّجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى The Prophet does not speak of revelations it does not speak except of revelations from the Lord. He doesn't speak of his own will. Rasulullah, who came to establish salah. Why would Rasulullah wait for a person to come and give him an opinion on the basis of a dream? As in, with all due respect to Abdullah bin Zayd, we never listened to Abdullah bin Zayd when he was awake. Why would I listen to him when he's in his sleep? As in, Abdullah bin Zayd isn't some authority everybody would go and listen to. Why would Rasulullah listen to Abdullah bin Zayd and the Lord of the heavens not give the adhan to Rasulullah? Therefore, in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we came to a conclusion. What is it? <coughs> Within our text, it clearly says that Rasulullah received the adhan on the night of Mi'raj. On the night of Mi'raj, Rasulullah received the adhan. The adhan was given to him on the night of Mi'raj. Upon his return from the night of Mi'raj, he dictated the adhan to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He brought Amir al-Mu'mineen next to him. He said to him, Oh Ali, this is the adhan which will be used as a call for prayer. You see, it's not disrespect to my brothers in Ahl sunnah At the end of the day, in their works, they believe it's Abdullah bin Zayd. Whereas in our works, we believe that Rasulullah brings the adhan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who teaches Rasulullah to teach us salah. Likewise, Allah will teach Rasulullah to bring the adhan. He brings the adhan towards whom? He brings the adhan on the night of Mi'raj to Rasulullah. Rasulullah then teaches the adhan to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Amir al-Mu'mineen then teaches the adhan to who? Teaches the adhan to the first adhan reciter in the Muslim community. Because you know, when Rasulullah established salah, when the verses came down about salah, you found that all of the Muslims knew that now that Rasulullah is going to initiate an adhan, all of the Muslims were wondering who's he going to choose to be his mu'addin. As in everybody there 
was of known repute, their Arabic was very strong, their pronunciation was great, some of them came from some of the most famous Arab tribes. You found all of them were waiting. Who's he going to choose? Who's he going to choose? He tells Amir al muminin call for me Bilal. When Ali ibn Abi Talib is told to call Bilal, he goes and calls Bilal. When Rasulullah sees Bilal, what does he state? When he sees Bilal, he states that Bilal, you are the one to recite the Adhan for us. When the Arabs heard this, you know that racist tendency was still there. As in, even though they had come to Islam, sometimes even if you've come to Islam, racism can still affect you, don't worry. I'm telling you, there are people who cry for Aba Abdullah on the 10th of Muharram, they're more racist than a non-Muslim, believe me. Believe me, a Muslim can be more racist than anybody else. Irrespective of whether he says, I love Hussein and I love Zainab, that you keep to yourself sometimes. You find Rasulullah showed us when I called Bilal to become my muaddin, the first to attack me were who? The first to attack me were the Muslims. You know what the rumor was going around? Muhammad's, uh, uh, Muhammad's calling his black crow to read for us. The black crow they described him as. These are Muslims amongst the new Muslims. Yet still that racist tendency was within them. Subhanallah, nothing changes even in our communities today. You'll find within our communities today that 1,400 years later, that arrogance towards other races is present. An Arab may be racist against someone of Indian origin. Someone of Indian origin may be racist against someone of black origin. I tell you, there are even some countries today, Muslim countries, Wallah, I swear by Allah, that when they see a black person in their roads, they are mystified. Firstly, that he's in their road. Secondly, they are surprised that he's a Muslim as well. Some of them, because they think they're the only Muslims. Everybody else is not Muslim, only them. Allah just chose them and he put them on the earth. You find Rasulullah when he asked Bilal, the reason he was asking was what? The reason he was asking was he was destroying the racism amongst the Muslims. And that's why Rasulullah wanted to highlight to us, the Mu'addin of my community, I don't look for his color. Rather, I look for the taqwa that he has. The consciousness of Allah's presence in his life. You found Rasulullah, if you look at his best friends, they came from different countries. Bilal, Abyssinia. Salman, Persia. Did Rasulullah build a members only club for people from one country? No, he didn't. Rasulullah, what did he do? Rasulullah built an institution where every Muslim was welcome. Never once would he look at their race. And that's why I'm not surprised that later on, when our sixth Imam marries a lady from North Africa, seventh Imam, lady from North Africa, eighth Imam, lady from North Africa, ninth Imam, lady from North Africa, tenth Imam, lady from North Africa. I ask them, I say, Imams of Ahlul Bayt, why don't you marry only from Medina? No, it's because we want to destroy racism. We marry from Africa without any problem. So why can't our communities do the same? When he called Bilal, the rumor went round. What was it? The rumor that went round was Muhammad calls his black crow. At the same time, the second rumor that went round on the Adhan was what? Bilal couldn't pronounce Sheen. Bilal used to say Seen. When he comes to a line in the Adhan, there are many lines in the Adhan which have Sheen. So some people came forward and said, Ya Rasul Allah, Bilal, when he recites the Adhan, instead of Ashhadu, he's going to say S. Hadu. Surely you have better than Bilal to recite. To which Rasulullah replied, The scene of Bilal is sheen in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. The niya is vital. That when it comes to a pronunciation, what's vital is the niya. If your niya is to pronounce the letter properly, <coughs> Allah understands your background. When it came to Bilal, Bilal would come and he'd recite the Adhan. And I tell you, Rasulullah used to say, Oh Bilal, please me with your voice. Oh Bilal, soften me with your voice. And that's why after Rasulullah died, Bilal had a monumental political stand after Rasulullah died. What was the stand after Rasulullah died? I defy anyone to show me Bilal reciting Adhan for the governments after Rasulullah. Bilal stops reciting Adhan. Why? The Mu'addin of Rasulullah stops reciting Adhan. Why? It's because Bilal recognized 
that these governments who have come after Rasulullah have usurped the right of the man chosen by Allah on the day of Khadir. And that's why he was exiled to Sham. Those of you here, how many of you have been to Bab al-Saghir in Sham? When you've been to Bab al-Saghir, you see the grave of Bilal and Bibi Fadda, isn't it? In Sham. Bilal, why did he die in Sham? Because they exiled him. Get out! How dare you stop reciting Adhan for our government? In the time of Rasulullah, you are a Mu'addin. Why don't you recite? And especially, why don't you recite for the man who freed you when you were a slave? Because the idea was that Abu Bakr, the first Khalifa, freed Bilal when Bilal was a slave. So Umar ibn al-Khattab said to him, he said to him, Oh Bilal, Abu Bakr freed you, and now you don't recite Adhan for him? Bilal replied, if he freed me, so I worked for him, then here I am, I'll be his slave now and I'll continue to work for him. If he freed me for the sake of Allah, then Allah will reward him. But if he freed me to leave the man chosen on the day of Ghadir, that I will not do. The man chosen on the day of Ghadir, I remain loyal to him for the rest of my life. And that's why in Ikhtiyar al-Rajal of Shaykh al-Tawsi, it's clearly mentioned, Bilal al-Bashi. May Allah have mercy on him, for he remained loyal to us, al-Muhammad. He never left us when others left us after Rasulullah died. And that's why the power of Adhan was there. That later, our fourth Imam would say in Risalat al-Hukuq, I recommend all of you brothers and sisters, after the Qur'an, read Risalat al-Hukuq of our fourth Imam. In one, of, one part of Risalat al-Hukuq, do you know what the Imam says? The right of the Mu'addin. Risalat al-Hukuq is the treaties of rights. The right of God, the right of yourself, the right of your father, the right of your mother, the right of your, of your non-Muslim companion, the right of your parents and so on. One of the chapters is called the right of the Mu'addin. You think the Mu'addin in the community is something small? Imam Zain al-Abideen in Risalat al-Hukuq, you know what he says? The right of the Mu'addin in your community is that you go and thank him for he calls you towards the greatest rizq. Isn't it? Isn't salah the greatest rizq in our life? Is there a sustenance like salah? That man when he says, Ayya ala salah, that man's calling us to the greatest rizq. So Imam Zain al-Abideen says, go and thank the Mu'addin in your community. For the Mu'addin is the one who brings you towards the greatest rizq. That's why sometimes when we have a Mu'addin in our community, go and say thank you to him when he says, Hayya ala salah. For he's inviting you towards the doors of Allah's bounties. Therefore you found Adhan originated in the school of Ahlul Bayt in this way. And that you find, therefore the question arises. That if the Adhan in the time of Rasulullah was Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah. Hayya ala al-falah, hayya ala al-falah. Hayya ala khair al-amal, hayya ala khair al-amal. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Then where did we get ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah from? It's a fundamental point. If that's the adhan, why are we including ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah? Firstly, when someone attacks me with this question, normally it's not someone who, who talks to you politely. Normally it's someone who's like, where's the Sashad on Ali and Allah from? Say, hold on brother, calm down. Sit down, let's discuss this issue in a, in a way which is academic. You are right. There shouldn't be additions or subtractions from the Adhan. But before you pinpoint Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah, I just mentioned that the Adhan of Rasulullah included where is it gone? The Adhan of Rasulullah said, Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah. Hayya ala al-falah, hayya ala al-falah. Hayya ala khair al-amal, hayya ala khair al-amal. Today I defy you to go to any mosque in the Muslim world of a school other than the school of Ahl al-Bayt where they say, Hayya ala khair al-amal. Hayya ala khair al-amal in English, what does it mean? Come to the best of deeds. Yes? Khair, best, amal, deeds. Come to the best of deeds. I ask before I look at Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah, where did Hayya ala khair al amal go? Let's see what the books of hadith say. The books of hadith say that in the time of the second Khalifa, Umar ibn al Khattab, what did Umar decide? Umar wanted people to go on jihad. If you want to, brothers and sisters, once again, go to Malik's Muwatta or go to the Sharh of the Muwatta by Zarqani. 
Look at the analysis of Hayya ala khayr al-amal. They say that Rasulullah who used to say Hayya ala khayr al-amal in his adhan, then Umar ibn al-Khattab when he became Khalifa after Abi Bakr, Umar decided to remove this. Why? He wanted jihad to be khayr al-a'mal, not salah. Because he wanted more and more soldiers to be going for war. If salah is the greatest deed, people would turn around and say, hold on, salah is greater than jihad. So Umar said, remove hayya ala khayr al-amal. I want jihad to be the best of a'mal. Brothers and sisters, I don't mind if another Muslim has this opinion. But to me, a person other than Rasulullah cannot change the adhan of Rasulullah. I can't have the ijtihad of someone come from the nas, uh, against the nas of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar ibn al-Khattab, while he is respected in other schools, at the end of the day, he can't come to the adhan and say, in my opinion, jihad is greater than salah. Remove, remove hayya ala khayr al-amal. Firstly, there is that. Secondly, before we get to ashadu anna ali and wali Allah, can I add something to the adhan? If you say, I can't add ashadu anna ali and wali Allah, then I reply to you by saying, hold on a minute. Then how about the addition of as salah to khayrun min al no. Every Fajr Salah in the Muslim world today, except the Ja'fari school, every Fajr Salah, before the Salah you will hear, prayer is better than sleep. Prayer is better than sleep. Once again, I ask the question, because our lectures are to bring Muslims together, not to disunite. We seek to understand from each other. I asked the question, as salatu khayrun min al-nawm? Rasulullah said, as salatu khayrun min al-nawm? No. Because there's no way Rasulullah will be found sleeping at the time of Fajr. Rasulullah would not need to think about this. Then who is it that said it? Abi Bak? No. The first Khalifa did not allow as salatu khayrun min al-nawm into Adhan. He's not the one who innovated it. Who again is the one who brought it into the Salah? The one who brought it into the Salah, into the Adhan, was Umar ibn al-Khattab. On one occasion, Umar is awoken by someone who said to him, as salatu khayrun min al -nawm. He said, that would make a good addition in our adhan. Now, brothers and sisters, this is an academic analysis. It's not a humorous session. I'm not belittling the opinions of another school in Islam. We are discussing the heritage of Muslims. This is not something for us to laugh at. There may have been others before here who found this as an entertainment center. I don't. I find this as a center for academic analysis between Muslims. So when Umar ibn al-Khattab came, he removed hayya ala khayr al-amal, and he added as salatu khayr min al-nawm. That's why when you come to ashadu anna aliyan waliyullah, is ashadu anna aliyan waliyullah a part of the Adhan school of al -Bayt? No, it's not. Ashadu anna aliyan waliyullah is not part of the Adhan school of al -Bayt. In terms of it being an obligatory part, it's not an obligatory part. Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah at the most, at the most, is a recommended statement to say after you've blessed the Holy Prophet. Please just understand this very delicate point. When we say Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah, firstly, what do we mean when we say Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah? We mean when we say Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah in the English language that we swear that Ali is the guardian of Allah's message on earth after the Prophet. Okay? When we say, Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah, we believe Ali ibn Abi Talib is Allah's guardian on earth. Meaning, the guardian of Allah's message on earth. After the Prophet died, the Khalifa is meant to be Ali. Because of three attributes. The first attribute is what? is that Ali ibn Abi Talib upheld the message of Rasulullah all his life. The second is that Ali ibn Abi Talib spread the word of Rasulullah. The third is that Ali ibn Abi Talib was chosen by Allah to succeed Rasulullah on the day of Ghadir. Therefore, when someone upholds the message of Allah, spreads the message of Allah, and is chosen by Allah, then that person is called Waliullah. Someone says, Waliullah, Ali ibn Abi Talib being, being Waliullah. If this is part of our creed, it should be in the Quran. It is in the Quran and specifically in the Quran. And in the Quran, in the verse which I quoted at the beginning of my majlis, the verse I quoted at the beginning of my majlis is the clearest verse about the wilaya of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. That the word Wali 
is used in reference to Amir al Mu'mineen. What does the verse state? The verse is Surah 5, verse 55. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Please listen to this verse carefully and don't just listen. If you have a couple of minutes in Shah Ramadan, try and memorize the verse. Build relationship with the Quran. The verse says what? Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Innama waliyukum Allahu. Now, wilaya, guardianship, is of two types. There's a wilaya amma, a general guardianship, and there's a wilaya khasa, a particular guardianship. Wilaya amma, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has a general guardianship over all this creation. Do you agree? How many times have you read the verse in the Quran? Allah waliyu alladhina amanu, yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumati ila al-nur. Allah is the guardian of those who believe. He takes them from darkness into light. This is wilaya am, that Allah guards and looks after all of His creation. Then we have wilaya khasa. What is wilaya khasa? Wilaya khasa is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to give portions of His guardianship to a chosen believer on earth. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ Your wali is Allah. وَرَسُولُهُ Now the guardianship is being given. I, I, when Allah speaks in the Quran, He is saying, I am the independent wali. But if I choose, I may give portions of my wilaya to my creation. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Now Allah gives this wilaya to the Rasul. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And those who believe. But Ya Allah, you've given your wilaya to all those who believe? No, 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 no. There's a condition. الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ There's a condition. What is it? Ya Allah, you're telling me about your wilaya and who you give it to. You are the wali. And your Rasul is the wali, and those who believe. But a condition for those who believe. Who are they? Those who give away zakat, those who establish salah, and give zakat while in ruku'. Wait. Someone says, there's nothing special about that. People pray, and people give zakat, and people do ruku'. Look at the verse again. There's something very specific. What is it? يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ Yes? Is ruku' part of salah? Is ruku' part of salah? Yes. So why do I need to mention ruku' specifically later? Just think about it. الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ That's it. Ruku' is part of salah. Why do I need to mention later and those who are in ruku' Ya Allah, but salah involves ruku' It means an act took place specifically in ruku' Where one man and one man alone in history gave away his ring in his ruku'. Now, in the mosque of Rasulullah in Medina, a poor man walks around looking for someone to give him some charity. And everyone is busy, none will give him. He stood in the mosque of the Prophet and he said, Ya Allah, I have come to the Prophet's mosque in Medina and I have looked around for charity and none has given me. Ya Allah, I ask you to answer my dua under this dome, under this mosque. Answer my dua with someone giving me some charity. The moment he asked this dua, can't Allah answer a dua in a split second if he wants to? And there was a man in his salah. And a true salah is a mi'raj of a mu'min, isn't it? If you're truly concentrating in your salah, you're in mi'raj. Rasulullah used to say, as-salat mi'raj al-mu'min. Ali ibn Abi Talib begins his salah. This man begins his dua. Ali ibn Abi Talib finishes as he's going towards ruku'. This man's dua is to be answered. Allah wanted to use an intermediary to answer this man's dua. He used Ali ibn Abi Talib in ruku' to answer this man's dua. Some came forward and said what? Come, some came forward and said, that means Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't concentrate in salah. Because how could Ali ibn Abi Talib know there's a poor man? Ibn Jawzi, the famous scholar of Ahlul Sunnah says, all of you have got it wrong. When a man is intoxicated with love for his Lord, then his Lord uses him to answer the prayers of his believers. 
Says Ali ibn Abi Talib was so intoxicated in the love that in one moment he was a servant of Allah and a servant of the creation of Allah at the same time. And that's why when he gave away this ring, someone says, yes, but do all schools believe something happened with the ring in Ruku'ah? If you go to the tafsir of Dr. Wahb al-Zuhayli, one of the famous renowned scholars of Ahlul Sunnah until today, in his tafsir he says, definitely, definitely, something was given away in Ruku'ah. It was either Abu Bakr or Ali. No problem, no problem, I don't mind. It's either Abu Bakr or Ali who gave away his ring for this verse. That's good enough for me. Because in my literature, it's Ali. At least in their literature, they admit that yes, something happened in Ruku'ah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Salah involves Ruku'ah, would not say, وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Salah already involves Ruku'ah. It means that in Ruku'ah, Ali ibn Abi Talib became Allah's wali on earth. So the verse said, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And the man who gave away. That was the wilaya being given. Therefore, we believe in Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah that Amir al Mu'mineen through this verse was made Allah's wali. Does this give us a right to take our belief of Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah and place it in Adhan? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Just because you believe in something doesn't mean you come and start changing the Adhan. Otherwise, what Umar ibn al Khattab did, there's nothing wrong with it. Umar ibn al Khattab added to the Adhan, subtracted from the Adhan. We in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we never say and we do not accept anyone who believes Ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah is an obligatory portion of the adhan. Never. To think that Ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah is wajib in adhan is wrong and is not part of our school. So someone asks, then what was the basis of Ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah? The basis comes from a number of angles. And please try and understand this delicate discussion. The basis comes from a number of angles. Firstly, someone says, Sheikh al-Saduq, on some of the notes of Man la yahdarahu al-Faqih, Sheikh al-Saduq sends la'na on a group called the Mufawwadha, who say, Ash'adu anna aliyan waliullah. He says la'na on them. <coughs> Sheikh al-Saduq does la'na on the one who says, Ash'adu anna aliyan? The Mufawwadha, one opinion is that they were of the belief that Ashhadu Anna Ali and Waliullah is a wajib part of Adhan. Shaykh al Saduq reached a stage where he even did la'na by saying what? By saying, you can't just come and add a portion to the Adhan and say that it's a wajib part. The Adhan that came with Rasulullah, that is the Adhan that is wajib. So then the question arose why would the ulama allow Ashhadu Anna Ali and Waliullah? They allowed it because of a number of reasons. One reason was. They say, yes, it's not wajib. But we have many hadiths which say, whenever you praise me, praise Ali bin Abi Talib. Many hadiths from Rasulullah. Rasulullah has many hadiths where he says, whenever you send blessings on me, send your blessings on Ali bin Abi Talib. That doesn't mean that I, when I say, Ashhadu anna Ali wa Allah, doesn't mean that it's part of the Adhan. No, it means when I've just finished Ashhadu anna Muhammad and Rasulullah, as part of a sunnah, or in Bab al-Tasamuh fi sunan what do I do? I come forward and I say, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ عَلِيًّا وَلِيَ Do you notice the wow even there? Do you notice the wow? It's like, أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ عَلِيًّا وَلِيَ اللَّهِ Not that I'm making أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ عَلِيًّا وَلِيَ اللَّهِ part of Adhan, but that what I'm praising is I'm praising Ali because I've just praised the Holy Prophet as well. And that's why, what you find of the utmost importance here, that we say very clearly that a person cannot come and say, Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah is part of the Adhan. No. Even our brothers in Mecca and Medina, if I, if I did not look at their niya, I can show you some of the du'as they say before and after Adhan, I could look at them and say, you've made this part of the Adhan. Let me give you an example. When they come forward in the Adhan, before the Adhan, you hear the du'a, Allahumma akfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, wal muslimina wal muslimat, al ahyao minhum wal amwat, ta'ba Allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat, innaka mujibu al-da'awat, innaka ala kulli shayin qadir. Every Adhan, you hear this du'a. Someone can easily turn around and accuse them and say, how could you add that to Adhan? How dare you? They say, no, no, we're not adding it. But we were told, when you recite a portion in Adhan, read this du'a as well. Likewise with us, we were told that whenever you praise Rasulullah, after it praise Ali ibn Abi Talib. Wajib that I add Ali ibn Abi Talib in Adhan? No. 
A person who recites adhan and thinks ashadu anna ali wa is wajib, his adhan is void. Let's be clear on that. This is not a competition where people have to put forward their beliefs. And that's why I remember Shaykh al tusi saying something very clearly. Shaykh al tusi in his book al Mabsut, Shaykh al tusi within the Mabsut, you know what he says? He says there is no sin on the person who says ashadu anna ali and waliullah. But he is doing it from the door of what? From the door of recommendation. That when Rasulullah is praised, you praise Amir al muminin That's it. Shaheed al awwal in al lum al damashqiyya Shaheed al awwal says, Ashhadu anna Ali and Waliullah is the central belief in the school of Al Muhammad because it's the protection of the message of Rasulullah. But that does not mean it becomes part of the adhan just because you believe in it. No. You say it from the door that you're praising Amir al muminin no problem. But you don't just say, because I believe in Ashhadu anna Ali and Allah, I'm going to include it in adhan. No. The religion doesn't work like that. Otherwise, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to include things in Adhan, isn't it? I'm telling you, everyone will start including things in Adhan on what they believe. No. What Rasulullah said, we follow. But when Rasulullah says, whenever you hear me being praised, praise Ali, we go to that extent as well. And that's why even later, one of the greatest theories ever given for the importance of reciting Ashhadu Anna Ali and Allah, but not with the intention of obligatoriness, was the great scholar Ahmed al-Zanjani. May Allah bless the soul of Ahmed al-Zanjani, one of the greatest scholars we had. Ahmed al-Zanjani, you know what he says? He says, you know why the Shia were so passionate to say, Ashhadu anna Ali and wali Allah? It's not that they were saying it because they felt it's a wajib part of Adhan. No, they knew it was not a wajib part of the Adhan. There are no Imams of Ahlul Bayt who in their Adhan ever said, Ashhadu anna Ali and wali Allah. They may have uttered Ashhadu anna Ali and wali Allah, after praising Rasulullah, but they never said this is a wajib part of Adhan. He says, Do you know why many of the followers of Ahlul Bayt stress on Ashhadu Anna Ali wa Because they saw on the pulpits of Bani Umayyah every Friday khutbah was cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Every Friday khutbah for over 60 years, there was a curse on Amir al Mu'mineen. Every Friday prayer. Mughira bin Shu'ba, when he was governor, Ziyad bin Abi when he was governor, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan when he was Khalifa. Every Khalifa of Bani Umayyah would pay people on the pulpit at the Adhan time to say, may God's curse go on Ali bin Abi Talib. I tell you, some of this history we have is ridiculous, honestly. Honestly. That when there are so-called great generations of Caliphs who order the people to curse Amir al muminin Ahmed al-Zanjani, you know what he said? He said, when the Shia are passionate about Ashadu anna Ali wa Allah, it's not because they believe it's wajib. It's because they saw years of cursing that man. So they wanted to reply that we swear that man is our guardian forever. Will you see these people, Muawiyah, there is a, in a hadith within the Sahah, Muawiyah comes to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. He says to him, Sa'ad, why don't you curse Ali ibn Abi Talib? Sa'ad replies, I will never curse Ali ibn Abi Talib because of three things. The first is the day of Khaybar. That all of us were waiting to see who's going to be given the banner on that day. And Allah decided to give his banner to a man who Rasulullah said, me and him love Allah and Allah and me love him. That day we were waiting, the following day it was given to Ali ibn Abi Talib. The second was the event of Mubahala. When Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Quran said, he is the nafs of Rasulullah on the day of Mubahala. The third is the incident of Tabuk when Rasulullah said, Ali is to me, like Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no prophet after me. He said, I would never curse Ali ibn Abi Talib when Ali ibn Abi Talib has these merits. You found it became normal to curse Amir al muminin every Friday in Salat al Jum'ah. They would begin the khutbah with a curse on Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's why you find, do you know who ended this? Ironically, one of the Khulafa of Bani Umayyah stopped this. Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar bin Abdul Aziz from a young age, he used to have a love for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? Umar bin Abdul Aziz says when we were young, we would curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. It would be like, you know, the swear word of the time. You'd curse Amir al muminin He said from a young age, we would curse Amir al muminin And when we would curse Amir al muminin one day my Quran teacher frowned at me when I cursed. When he frowned at me, I looked at him. And I said to him, you know, it's a young Umayyad boy, he's a prince. He said, I looked at my teacher and I said, how dare you frown at me like that? What have I said wrong? He said, Umar, when we recited the Quran, did we talk about the people of Battle of Badr? He said, yes. 
He said, does Allah praise those who fought at Badr? He said, yes, he does. He says, what do you think of a person who killed 35 out of the 70 on the day of Badr? He said, that person's a great man. That he could kill 35 out of 70? He said, that person is the one you children all curse every day. Umar bin Abdul Aziz says, even when I used to speak to my father, Abdul Aziz, he says, Wallah, when he used to come to mentioning the name of Ali, he'd stutter. He is so eloquent, but when he brings the name of Ali, he stutters. I said to him, Dad, what's wrong? Whenever you bring this man's name, you stutter. Every other man's name, you're so eloquent. He said, because this man, if people knew what he was, they'd never give us power. This man, if people knew what he was, us Bani Umayyah would not be in power. This man until today, there is stuttering that comes within us. Therefore you found when we the Shia say, Ashadu anna Ali and Waliullah, are we saying it with the niyyah that it's part of Adan? No. We are saying it that the idea was that Rasulullah said, whenever you praise me, you praise Imam Ali. That Rasulullah on the night of Mi'raj saw Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Ashadu anna Ali and Waliullah written, and that we are hurt by those who cursed Ali and the children of Ali. That our statement, Ashadu anna Ali and Waliullah, is the statement of Hujr bin Adi, and Amr bin Hamak al Khuzai, and Rushayd al Hajari, and Maytham al Tamar. Those who sacrificed their lives to look after the wilaya of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. You hear in my lecture at the beginning, what do I say? Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'alana. من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب. My praise to Allah who allowed me to hold on to the guardianship of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's why Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas would not curse. Muawiyah said to him, curse Ali. Sa'ad wouldn't. The irony of ironies that Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas's son Umar ibn Sa'ad takes after the command of the religion of Islam. His father Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas wouldn't curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. Whereas Umar bin Sa'ad ends up not just cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib, but cursing the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and massacring the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do you know Imam al Hussein how much he told Umar bin Sa'ad before Karbala? He said to him, Umar bin Sa'ad, I tell you, like I've told Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi, that they've promised you great governments, great palaces, you won't get any of them. What has Yazid promised you? He said, Yazid has promised me, Ray. Ray, which is modern day Tahran. He said, Yazid has promised me Ray. Imam al Hussein said to him, Umar, I'm telling you, you will not get Ray. He will not give you anything. When have you seen Bani Umayyah be loyal to their promises? Then he looked at him and he said, Oh, Umar bin Sa'ad, you curse my father Ali, and you curse my mother Fatima, and you curse me as well. I'm willing to give you the land of Bughaybagha. The Bughaybagha was a piece of land on the outskirts of Medina which Muawiyah used to beg Imam Ali to sell to him. Muawiyah used to beg Imam Ali, sell me the Bughaybagha. The Bughaybagha was a huge piece of land which was worth millions at the time. Muawiyah used to beg Imam Ali, Imam Ali used to never sell it to him. Imagine Imam al Hussein tells Umar bin Sa'ad, Umar bin Sa'ad, Yazid promises you Ray, but have you seen Ray given to you? I'll give you the Bughaybagha, which is worth more than Ray. Take the Bughaybagha. He said, I don't want nothing from you and nothing from your family. Imam al Hussein said, Oh, Umar bin Sa'ad, I see you with your body being kicked by children in the streets. You know, when Mukhtar caught Umar bin Sa'ad, he absolutely annihilated Umar bin Sa'ad and his son, and they beheaded them. Imam al Hussein told him, He said, Have respect for yourself. Do not do such an act. Umar bin Sa'ad said, I don't want anything that you offer me. If someone gave me bread, that would be enough for me to kill you and see you dead on the ground. And that's why you find the way he treated the daughters of Imam al Hussein after Karbala. The way he ordered Shimr bin Dil Joshan to go and whip the daughters of Abu Abdullah, running from tent to tent. The granddaughters of Ali ibn Abi Talib were running from tent to tent in a city where their leader used to lead. They were now being abused. In a city where their grandfather used to be respected, they were disrespected. But Imam Zain al Abidin taught us one thing. When they told Imam Zain al Abidin, your father has been defeated and your grandfather has been embarrassed, he said, let's wait to see what happens in Sham. And truly, what was the symbol that Imam Zain al Abidin proved that they were victorious? As soon as the Adhan was recited. When the Adhan was recited, that was when Imam Zain al Abidin said, now who's victorious? Me or him? Whose name is being recited from the Adhan? Then you'll know who won at Karbala. And Imam Zain al-Abidin, as soon as he heard Allahu Akbar, 
He said, there is none greater than Allah. Then when he heard, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, he said, my skin and my flesh and my body and my eyes, all testify to the oneness of Allah. Then when he heard, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, he looked at Yazid and he said to him, Oh Yazid, is Muhammad your grandfather or mine? If you say he is yours, then you are a liar. But if you say, but if you know that he is mine, then why did you kill his grandson on the plains of Karbala? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam to bring an understanding between the Muslim Ummah and the history of Adhan. Allow us to be amongst those who hold on to the wilayah of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the guardianship of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ya Allah, allow us to visit his holy grave in the land of Najaf. Allow us to sit by that holy grave. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all our deceased members of the community. Oh Allah, raise them with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Allah. <laughs> <laughs>